edition of Politics and Run. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of the show. We're going to have a great show for you today. Today we have a very, very special guest that I think you're going to like. Uh, he's a documentary producer. But before we get there, you know COVID-19 is the thing. And earlier today I interviewed uh, another uh, John Perkins. I'll have that interview more than likely on Monday. He's an, an activist, a former... A uh, big wheel meet, meets with many heads of states and the World Bank and all of that kind of stuff. And he wrote a book um, a while back called, I think it's a Confessions of a Hitman or something like that. He's, a, he's an economic hitman, actually, because uh, when he talks about what goes on, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. But anyhow, what I'm going to do, uh, first of all, is I'm going to play the COVID-19, a piece of the COVID-19 uh, thing, uh, press, presser today. And then we'll talk about it on the other side. So let me go ahead and do that, and then we'll talk about it on the other side. Can you have a question for the doctors on childcare? Sure. Uh, on the campaign, it really does sound, though, like you're saying, do as we say, not as we do. You're telling people to listen to local officials, but in Tulsa, you defied local health officials to have an event that, even though you say it didn't result in a spike, dozens of Secret Service agents, dozens of campaign staffers are now quarantined after positive tests. And then in Arizona, one of the hardest hit states, you packed a church with young people who weren't wearing masks. So how can you say that the campaign is not part of the problem that Dr. Fauci laid out? Well, I, I want to remind you again that the freedom of speech and the right to peaceably assemble is enshrined in the Constitution of the United States. Uh, and even in a health crisis, the American people don't forfeit our constitutional rights. And working with state officials, um, uh, as we did in Oklahoma and as, uh, uh, as we did uh, in Arizona. Uh, we're creating settings where people can choose to participate uh, in the political process. And, uh, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, it, it, I, think it's, I think it's really important uh, that we recognize how important, uh, how important freedom and personal responsibility are to this entire equation. And, but allowing, allowing younger Americans, allowing Amer younger Americans to understand, particularly in the counties that are most impacted, um, uh, the unique challenges uh, that uh, we're facing uh, in their age group, we think uh, is important. But look, it's, it's, it's so important that we recognize that, that as we issued guidance to reopen America now two months ago, and now as all 50 states are opening up our country again, people are going back to work, American everyday life is being restored kind of one step, one day at a time. I, I think it's important that we remind ourselves this is not a choice between the health of the American people and a strong economy. There are profound health implications uh, to the lockdowns through which we just passed. I heard, it, I heard a statistic not long ago at a, at, a, at a task force briefing that in one jurisdiction there had been a 50% increase in the number of people presenting at emergency rooms having attempted suicide. I mean, there are profound mental health issues. There are profound economic issues, people needing to be back to work. And, um, and so we're... we're uh, our objective here today is just to make sure the American people know in 34 states the cases are largely stable and there's no combination of rising cases and rising positivity rates. That's a tribute to the American people. And in the, in the 16 states we're focused on uh, today, um, we simply want to we want to equip particularly young people with the knowledge of the part that they can play in, in stemming uh, the rising tide of new cases, not because the coronavirus represents a significant threat to them. In most cases, it doesn't if you're a younger American, but because we don't, no younger American would ever want to spread the coronavirus to someone who would have a serious outcome. Um, but I'm, I'm grateful for the time today. Uh, we hope this has been helpful. Um, and uh, we'll be back with more information as time goes on. I'm now think about that answer. Uh, they are having a meeting today. 
this uh, the, the, the disingenuousness of that news conference, I, I need to first tell you, they are they are hitting this thing that says only three percent of counties in the America in the United States are actually spiking. And while that is true, the reality is that is where people live. Most counties around this country are empty wastelands, or I shouldn't call them wastelands, but they're empty counties. They're not counties with a lot of people. So when they talk about uh, 3% of counties is where the spikes are occurring, well, you talk about Houston, Miami, uh, LA, and all these other places, that's where most of your population is. And the spikes are occurring because of the negligence of government. So we know that. So the thing about it is for all of us that are out there uh, listening to these types of messages, it's imperative that we don't, if we're on Facebook, if we are on Twitter, if we are on Tumblr, or if we're just talking to people and, and you hear somebody make those silly statements, please correct them. Let them know that 3% of counties, what that means is probably half of the population that's where they are. I don't know if it's half the population, but it's pretty darn close. Let them let pe people understand what we're talking about here, because what the administration is doing right now is is not only wrong, it is dangerous, and it's killing people. And I I am not concerned about saying that the administration is killing people, and let's make all our friends understand that our administration is killing people. All right. I mentioned a, a statement. I, I spoke to, uh, look up who uh, John Perkins is. John Perkins, he's an author, wrote 10 books. I'm going to feature him on Monday. But we, went, we had a long, uh, long conversation today. And what was the interesting thing about it is that we discussed in detail uh, not only capitalism, not only COVID-19, but we started touched on an issue. That COVID-19, you know, things generally happen, and I, I use the phrase with, from, from one of his pieces that I want to use here. What I did with this phrase is uh, try to get him to, he, he made a statement that was very prescient. He said, life is composed of a series of coincidences over which we have no control. <clears throat> Once we are presented with such coincidences, we give choices. How we respond, the actions we take in the face of coincidences, makes all the difference. Why am I saying that? If you take a look at exactly what how our reaction was with COVID-19, and you take a look at China, and you take a look at the, 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 uh, the EU, they all took care of their people, meaning they didn't put their people in dire straits. None of their people are sitting down wondering if they will be bankrupt tomorrow. None of their people are sitting back there wondering if what are they going to do for health care. So that's what China, the European Union did. Their people are taken care of. We have depression style, uh, in depression style work issues now. Our workforce has an unemployment rate depression levels. In the EU, <clears throat> and I even heard a thing on China today, they have high unemployment because people have to social distance and people can't work in confined units either. But <clears throat> none of them are concerned about their future. None of them are concerned that somehow this pandemic will have a material defect on their entire, for, for the prognosis for the rest of their lives. But for COVID-19 and American citizens, they don't know. Because the erratic government that we have and the erratic portion of the uh, Republican Party and the neoliberal portion of the Democratic Party, they have no answers for Americans. They aren't saying, we are going to make you whole. They're all saying, we are going to make those guys on the top whole, and it may trickle down to you. And if you take a look at what has happened over every single shock that we've had, and we haven't had a shock like coronavirus, but if you have taken a look at what happened every shock, the middle class has declined and declined and declined and has never 
ever recovered back into the growth of the 60s and 70s. Never. We constantly help the top and they take the spoils and they give the pittance to everybody else. That is what happens. So this guy is not necessarily an anti-capitalist, but he has acknowledged that this is what capitalism has done. And he acknowledges all the things that need to be done to mitigate all of this. But the one thing we spoke about when we went into Central America and these other places is that while China is out building, China is out, he just came back from Panama and Nicaragua. China is building in Panama. China is building in Nicaragua. China is building in South America. China is giving stipends, giving money, is giving investing in these people. Is China any better than any other imperial power? No, they're not. But what they have done is learn from the United States. And in doing so, they have learned how to best get into these people's domains, into these people's good grace, into these people and work for these people. And in doing so, they are making a difference. They're making a difference so when I talk about is COVID-19 going to be that nail in the coffin of this U.S. empire, it is pretty darn conceivable that instead of having the United States as the sole pole and all the other major powers right under, that we have a dual, a dual poled uh, world in which the European Union and China dominates as the United States simply believes it is still a superpower, believes it is still in control as they go on and live their lives among each other. That's why you see Australia and New Zealand and all these guys, they, they have different packs with, with China. They have different packs with Europe. The United States now is not their big central concern anymore. So, again, we, we better start being cognizant that the days where we were known to be omnipotent, and let me, let me be frank, I don't know if it's, if, if it's a bad thing that, you know, that, that we have shared power. The only issue I have with it is as follows. We are talking political power here. What, we aren't, what, what supersedes political power, however, is corporate power. And what it really means is that the corporate centralization just moves from the United States to some other places. In other words, it's still going to remain corporate power, but the places where are demanded from uh, where we get issues from the from the corporations per se just won't be centralized in the United States any longer. But anyhow, with that, let's go ahead and move on to Kevin Bow, and we'll take it on the other side. Welcome to one more edition of Politics and Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Thank you so kindly for being with us. We are here with documentary producer Kevin Bow. Kevin Bow, I met Kevin Bow at Networks Nation, I believe, 2019. How are you doing, Kevin? Well, I'm about as hot as I am uh, last July. <laughs> oh, yes, it really it, it was hot, that mean, but you know, it's not Netroots if it's not hot. You know, even no, unfortunately, it's not Netroots right hot, now. You know? But thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So anyhow, you came up with a new documentary, The American Spring. And I uh, first, before we go into the technicalities of the documentary, what I love about what you did is that it seems like you understand something very important about the current level of uh, the current attention span of Americans in this time. So you didn't make it a very long documentary. Tell me a little bit about how you did this. Sure, sure. Well, you know, I, you got to learn the hard way, right? Uh, you know, my first work was uh, Democracy Through the Looking Glass, which uh, was a look at the 2016 election. I, I got to cover Trump in his first, you know, uh, few weeks in the New Hampshire primary and saw first hand. But, you know, it, it was your standard 75 minute long piece and uh, got a lot of good feedback at the festivals, you know, didn't didn't get bought by HBO or anything like that. And so it just sat there and and, you know, a lot of the activists would like to, you know, saw it and were excited, but you know, it's a really big ask a lot of times to to ask people to watch for a full 60 minutes or 70 minutes, and and if you then want to engage conversation and and call the action ideas, you know, it's a two or three hour event. 
So I, I decided to take a, an equally big problem. How do we try to uh, change the power dynamics in the country? But only break it, but break it down into small bits so that people can digest it. So there were only, it's a series of 10 minute um, uh, documentaries so that, you know, people either online can, you know, move on to something else. They don't have to prepare their entire night or even better, if you're going to have if grassroots people who are going to have meetings around the country, whether online or whatever, this is a great way, a new tool to bring in new members, you know, to, to show, to show 10 minutes, have a discussion, move on to other business or even better, you know, because it's a, a multiple series, I get right now, I got 10, uh, excuse me, I got three 10 three. minute um, breakups. You know, we got a half hour of content and soon I'll have about 60 minutes of content. So if you wanted to have a big event, if you wanted to have, you know, a panel with that, you know, that big three hour event of discussion, you can do that. But if you also wanted to just, you know, have a bunch of people over to talk about some reform politics and then, you know, maybe you're working on a local initiative uh, on gerrymandering reform, or maybe there's a local, uh, you know, any of the political interests, show a 10 minute, you know, rah, rah, um, not rah, rah, but, you know, show a 10 minute piece that's going to inform people and really motivate people to show that people can make a difference and get them to act locally. So, yeah, I designed it as 10 minutes to um, make it more usable in today's world. All right, Kevin, uh, and that is great. I think that was a good choice because, uh, you know, with, with the amount of work people have going around, having those little 10 minute increments, start, stop, start, stop. You, you created that good start, stop for them. You currently have three of them out, but before let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, the problems in society, the problem in America as you see it right now, because I think the problems are more serious than many of us think. And uh, I like the, the first three approach, the, the first three uh, segments that you have uh, out, I think is where things really have to begin because unless they begin there, and I, I imagine that's the reason why you chose those three topics as the beginning. So tell me what is the problem as you see today? Sure. You know, I guess at 60,000 feet, because that's where, you know, documentary people, you know, kind of live. It really, unfortunately, can be summed up in three words, you know, lack of trust. Nobody trusts anybody, you know, uh, people don't trust politicians, they're not trusting the police, they're not trusting the media, we're not trusting each other. And, you know, I, I think this lack of trust has really been, we all talk about a rigged system. And, and there's lots of things, you know, a game is played based on how the rules are. The outcome of a game is really shaped by the rules. And I am tackling uh, doing 10 minute pieces on the different rules that if they were changed, they can create more trust, they can create less negative politics. And so the first, not necessarily any order, but uh, the, one of them looks at money and politics. And you know, to me, that's the biggest. Um, how, and I really focus on getting money out of political campaigns. Because again, back to trust. Everybody knows or certainly assumes that the politicians can be bought. And even if they can't be bought, the politicians have got to spend 30, 40% of their time raising money. And so when we structure the rules of the game, where the, the way you get ahead in politics is just by, you know, asking rich people for money or worse or not worse or being a rich person with money, um, you change the outcome. You know, you're only going to have people that are catering to special interests or are part of, you know, the, the rich themselves. So we need to have public financing of campaigns to change the power structure so that more middle class people, people of color, uh, working class people can actually, you know, afford to, to run a campaign because I live in Massachusetts you know, to run for the state legislature just in the, the lowest um, state representative, that's $50,000. And state Senate is 200000 And then, you know, many places around the country, you know, can, we all know a congressional seat, you're going to have to raise a million, two million, you know, minimum. So that, those rules block out so many people. And if we, if we could change those rules, 
um, we'd have a whole lot more people um, running for office and we would be changing that power dynamic. So that was, that's one, I, that's one of the subjects I looked at. It's interesting because uh, when you talk about money in politics, we know about Citizens United and, and people calling uh, money is speech. And I, I think, uh, you know, how, how do you, why is it that you, can, that you can determine how much any one person can spend on any one election? I think it's important to note that a democracy requires several, that everybody participates and money that somebody's excess freedom can impinge on yours. Isn't that something that you're saying in respect to attempting to call money free speech? Well, yeah, I mean, it's a the whole money in politics. There's lots of layers of the issue. Certainly uh, money is speech on the Citizens United. And, and, you know, certainly that's one element of it. Um, Specifically in my uh, piece, I looked at a program in Connecticut, and there's a program like this in Maine, and there's a program similar to it in Arizona, and there's other programs similar around the country where you don't have to, you only have to raise a small amount of money, $5,000 to run for state representative, for instance, and that allows you, it qualifies you to get $30,000 so that you can run a political campaign without going to all these rich people and asking them for money. So while the money and speech is certainly, um, you know, a question, unfortunately, for the Supreme Court, there are other programs right now that can, that are working, that are, that are in place that, um, you know, I, I, I wish people would, would talk more about and would try to get past a but whole But let me cut you there because th there's an important question there. So I think you are saying you are willing to go around what the, the restrictions that we, not the restrictions, but the over benevolence that we have right now with rich people being able to give to campaigns as long as they pass policies that allow the regular guy to raise the minimum required to actually have an effective campaign. Yeah, it, 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 as long as we've got Citizen United, I mean, you know, we, we, we've got to attack money in politics on a couple of different levels. Clearly, you know, a, a constitutional amendment or a more su friendly Supreme Court is the only way we're going to overcome, you know, money is speech and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and ultimately, that's the solution. But in the meantime, we can have voluntary programs. You're right. You know, let the big guys write the three million dollar checks, but like so, for instance, um, there's a program in Seattle, and it's been proposed around the country called Democracy Voucher, vouchers, Democracy Bucks, something like that, where each citizen would have twenty five, fifty, a hundred dollars that they could give uh, to any campaign they wanted to, and they'd get a tax credit on it. You know, it it it, it would wash out. It's basically uh, public money but each taxpayer gets to decide who they want to donate to. So, you know, a lot of libertarian oriented people like that approach because it doesn't involve, you know, government handing out grants, uh, which is similar to some other programs. So in that system, yes, um, the idea would be that a million people with $25 vouchers will be able to match you know, the 25 people that write the million dollar checks. Um, not the most ideal thing, but until we get Citizen United overturned some way, that might be the world we have to live in for a little bit. Yeah, Citizens United and quite a bit more. McCutcheon and a few others as well that, uh, that, that are, that are yes. there in, in impinging, you know. Citizens United is what everybody talks about. They forget about McCutcheon and others. Now, um, let's go ahead and uh, talk about what you, what you came up with, the first three. Because when I went over your, 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 first of all, I went over to your site, looked at the, the trailer, and then I saw that the three that you started with, and, and I, I, was, I was pretty happy about that. You took care of gerrymandering, campaign financing reform, and ranked choice voting. I mean, you, you started out with democracy, voting, clean up the voting system. And if you have a clean voting system, people can feel like the persons they want to get involved in with the election will be the ones elected. So why don't we start out by talking a little bit about ranked choice voting. What do you mean by that? A lot of people don't understand exactly what that is. Sure, absolutely. And, and just even to take a step back a little bit, because 
you know, while ranked choice voting is uh, uh, a more popular alternative, there's a few other uh, systems that are being tested out around the country, um, approval voting and things like that. And even to take a step back again, you know, we, we with a two party system, we're in, many people aren't happy with that. It's the lesser of two evils. Um, there's not a lot of voices there. Uh, and also, if, a, if we want a third party choice, um, we have a dilemma. You know, we really want to vote for somebody else. You know, they, they more reflect either on the right or on the left of, of who you are. But you can't vote for them because you're afraid that you'll be wasting your vote and, and the candidate you really hate will win. So, you know, instead of voting for the candidate you want to win or you'd like to win, but you don't think they can win, you know, you vote for, for this. So we all feel that people on the left, people on the right. And, and, you know, um, so we get that spoiler or we even have some situations like in primaries. Uh, or, or in a general election where there's three candidates running, um, somebody wins a primary with 30% of the vote. Or, and, and, and if you're in a, if you're a Democrat and it's a strong blue district, that means if it's Congress, congressional seat, that means somebody gets 30% of a primary vote and basically becomes untouchable as an incumbent whether again, whether it's a Republican district or a Democratic district. So there's something unfair about that when it comes to democracy, when, somebody, when such a few group of voters can make that difference. And in the general election, you know, there's been cases where people win as governor with 45% of the vote, 40% of the vote. And you know, back to trust, well, who trusts a candidate or who believes in a, a, a candidate that, only, that, that doesn't win a majority? You know, how can you govern or state or, or whatever if, if you know they, they're not supported by the majority of the people? So ranked choice voting is a way that solves that. It's a way that, you know, allows you to vote for third party candidates without creating a spoiler. And it allows a way to have kind of a runoff and decide and between three candidates and find somebody who more than 50% prefer. So, you know, those are the benefits. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people, most voters have been in those kind of dilemmas that I described. So what's the solution, ranked choice voting? Well, it's exactly that. You have a, a ballot of let's say four candidates and you get to rank them one, two, three, four. Um, the, the first vote is, is your one. On the first ballot, everyone counts the ballots, counts the votes. And even if there's four candidates, if one of the candidates we wins 50% of the vote, the election's over. Simple as that. But if the candidates get, you know, 40%, 30%, 20%, 10%, I'm not going to do my math very well here. Um, the candidates at the bottom who got the smallest amount of votes, they are eliminated from the counting. And their second choice candidate vote is then reapplied to the people that still exist. So by process of elimination, eventually you will get a winner with 50% of the vote. And you can say with confidence that that candidate has a pref is, is the preference of the majority of the people. They're not the, the tried and true, uh, they don't have 40% of people that will walk off the, you know, a bridge for them, they got 50% or 51% of people in that, that scenario, believe in them. In that scenario, um, somebody, let's say uh, I got 45% and you got 35% yep. and there are other candidates. It could be that you are the ultimate winner, right? It, Even though it, I came, came out with it, the, um, the, the most first place. Yeah. And, and generally what will happen just to play that out is, you know, you've got your 45%, but it's a, it's kind of a hard, extreme 45%, although 45%, you can't be too extreme. Right. But, but, you know, the other, well, you, you, you know, you could be um, the more progressive. I could be the more middle person and the two people below me have, might reflect, 
might reflect me, you know? Right. Uh, so those, those candidates would tend to support me as a second vote. And yeah, you might not grow uh, your 45% because most of those uh, other voters of those other candidates, they, they right. like me better. And it's, and that's why ranked choice voting is so good because you open that up maybe by, by design. Because it's at this point, it's about if we're running hard against each other and we know that we've got two other candidates um, um, that aren't going to get a lot of, they're not going to win, but they're going to get a fair share of votes. You and I are going to try to appeal to their voters. You and I are going to maybe, you know, it, it, it's, it's a kind of a race. I don't want to say a race to the middle, but it's a race towards consensus. It's Actually, a that's race a, that's a, that is a better term, a race to consensus. Race to the middle is a, is a terrible phrase, but yes, race absolutely. to consensus is actually what we are and looking for. I'll, I'm going to use it because that's what it is. And I, and I nothing to the middle. <laughs> nothing to the middle. <laughs> that, that, that calls for no action, no, no, yeah. no moving forward, you know. But, and and, and the, the positive thing about this uh, ranked choice election, again, you know, it, it can, it can, it, be, it could go to the advantage of anybody, either conservative or liberal or, 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 or moderate, uh, depending on the dynamics. Right. So, you know, if, if there's many cases where, well, the mo most famous case, of course, was in Maine in 2018, which is what my piece is on. Um, you know, I, I, I talked to voters, I talked to reporters, I talked to um, election officials, and I told the story of how it happened in Maine. But um, in the congressional election, you know, there was four candidates running. And in the top two, of course, was a Democrat and a Republican. And then there was a, a Green candidate and an independent candidate. And because in, in a similar situation where the Republican got like 48%, and the Democrat maybe got 44%. I, I know I have these wrong a little bit. But in the end, the Democrat took the votes of the Green and the Independent. The, they were their second choice. And he won with 50 versus 49 or something. And, you know, unfortunately, Republicans, you know, oh, it was ranked choice voting stole the election from the GOP. Ranked choice voting is a Democratic scam and all that kind of stuff. But you know, the funny thing was in the next state over in New Hampshire, Kelly Ayotte lost to Maggie Hassan in the United States Senate. And that was a very big deal. Well, the reality is, is Maggie Hassan did not get 50% of the vote. And that there was a libertarian candidate to the very far right of Kelly Ayotte that, you know, acted as the spoiler. And because would have given their vote to Aya. I mean, to, yeah, to, they would have gotten their vote for Aya. So yeah. they lost out. On, so what, what you've proven is that is a pure system. We need to uh, move on to the others. And that is the other topic. I think the ranked choice voting is great, right? But uh, if we continue to have very gerrymandered uh, states, yes. uh, states that are very gerrymandered, we still run into problems that ranked choice votings are incapable of solving because you have sort of ideological uh, ideological fusion. Right. I mean, it, it all blends together. Everything builds on each other. No one of these problems is going to solve. You know, one of the, none of these solutions are going to solve everything. So, I mean, we I think we know the problem of gerrymandering. Uh, you know, just briefly. You know, the politicians get to carve out the districts that they run in and the controlling party gets to carve it in such a way that it distorts their power and, and marginalizes a lot of citizens. And because, you know, they, they draw the craziest districts that, you know, a, a 500 miles apart, they're all one thin line or, you know, they're boxing out people of color, et cetera. And that story has been told a lot, but what my film is about, my, my 10 minute piece is, the fact that it's all about citizen action that's going to get this done. And I highlighted the story in Michigan of a 20-something-year-old Katie Fahey who uh, wrote on Facebook in, Facebook in 2016, hey, you know, we've got to do something here. And 
it started a wave of 40,000 volunteers that got a, uh, a referendum to change the Mi Michigan's uh, constitution. And now they have independent commissions. Bodies, yeah that are, are gonna design these. I mean, it's still a complicated process, but we know at least there's gonna be a lot more fair, fairness in there. And in the, the, the thing to remember is, is that um, no one has the interest, the it's not in the politician's interest to have gerrymandering reform. It's not in the politician's interest to have a ranked choice voting that gives you more choices. It's not in the politician's interest to, you know, have campaigns publicly funded. And what the, the Katie Fahey story really shows is that it only can be the people. And the people are the only ones that have the interest to get this done. And it's us that has to do it. And in other words, uh, we have, if we want gerrymandered ended, it's first of all, that's a state issue. And we have to work within the state to uh, get that done. And for those those states that are very far apart, it's, it's hard to get the Congress to do it. But years like this, and I don't know how what you believe, I think years like this that uh, that are in such flux, I think is where those kinds of things can occur. Your thoughts? Uh, yeah. The, what, 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 are the, what are the things that are in flux? I apologize. No, no, I'm saying years like this, where things are oh. so disjointed, where things are it looks like there's so much chaos. This is where it is more effective to really attempt doing these types of major changes. Yes, well, you know, absolutely. I mean, to slightly switch the subject, uh, you know, the whole uh, George Floyd situation and, and the protests, you know, this is one wonderful opportunity, and I haven't really heard the talk about creating this constitutional amendment guaranteeing the right to vote. <laughs> and, and I mean, these are clearly the times that we need to pay attention. And I guess I take a, a of course, this is the time we, you know, the, the, these are horrible times, uh, you know, but I, I guess I would slightly, not disagree, but I would point out that um, we can fight for justice. We can fight for, for um, um, you know, against poverty, we can, we can fight to improve the climate, we can really try to fight for all of these issues people care about. But I would point out that if you're not addressing the structural problems first, you're not gonna be able to get the people in power that you need to address these problems. And, and so I, I would have a different you know, spin. I, I would say that uh, unfortunately before we try to pass climate change legislation, we need to get money out of politics so that um, whatever that let me say, legislation I, I looks we, like. I don't think we disagreed at all. I mean, yeah. what I'm saying is that in, that in times of flux like this, it's easier to pass those transformational changes you're talking about. I because, hope so. uh, Yeah, I, I don't, I, you know, in Texas, for, the governor is, is, is all over the place. The only way we could get something like this in Texas is because we're in such dire straits right now. Well, you know, I, I would say two things. Uh, you know, clearly, I don't want to make it a partisan thing, mm -hmm. uh, but clearly we need different power dynamics in the United States Senate, and we need power dynamics differently in, that, in, in the presidency. And I do think also, back to the state level, um, clearly the, the flux is a time to act, but at the same time, um, pe people on the left and the right agree with these they, they they agree with changing the status quo agreed absolutely and and, and, and that's that's this is the opportunity uh, i mean we're as we move ahead uh we are continually going to be breaking down you know the 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 two-party system institutions we're going to be breaking down um a, a lot of the you know the, the the industrial era kind of institutions and there's going to be a flex in ideologies and I think that we, I hope that the average Americans understand that issues like, you know, getting money out of politics and issues like fair, you know, boundaries that, 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 that work for the people and not the politicians. I hope that is just the norm with 80%, 90% of the, the, the citizens and, and, and not, you know, unfortunately everyone wants to make it a partisan thing. Um, 
but these issues are are resonate with everybody and i but, think that, that that's the opportunity now i you know i was a board member of um move to amend where we worked uh, on trying to get the 28th amendment uh, to get money out of politics and corporations are not people kind of a deal we had a lot of sponsors and one of the most important part of that that uh, group that organization is that we were completely non-partisan in the way we handled uh, the 28th amendment because it was important to bring folks of all sides into the into that domain and I think we're very effective of it and we continue to get sponsors it's just that the the, the power of the corporatocracy is that yep. huge that it's very hard to right. break through. But as people become smarter, as, pe as people like yourself make documentaries, as people go out there and hit the fields, as we do what I am doing and many others are doing, that are actually engaging and showing people their worth and their ability to make real change. They're gonna, as people assert their worth, they're gonna see that, you know what, I can actually do this. And, 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 and that's the other message, you know, is that I made this not for a bunch of people to watch on the internet. I made this for grassroots activists to take this out to the churches and to the, and to the <clears throat> different living rooms in your community and, and to talk to people and to show, you know, shit, this, is, this is how we're going to get this message out. It isn't going to be through, you know, the corporate media and, and, and what have you. So that's why I made these little bite-sized documentaries. Um, and you're right. You and I are in, in, you know, the same business. And we're both getting rich on it, aren't we? We wish. <laughs> Actually, you know, I mean, we, I, I tell you, to do this, you really have to have a passion for one, yeah. humanity. And you also have to have a passion for seeing a government that works. We're not the type that says government is bad. We're the type that says we want effective <clears throat> government, irrespective of ideology, we want effective government. Kevin Bo, what would you have liked me to ask you that you want to put out there? Sure. Well, where could people find the, <laughs> find the documentary? Um, it's on my website, Democracy Through the Looking Glass, which both will have the American Spring um, uh, uh, series, but also my other film, Dem Democracy Through the Looking Glass, which is a, a very dark look at, at the dystopian world of 2016. Not that the world has gotten any better, but um, you will find American Spring to be a little bit more uh, optimistic <laughs> than 2016. No, I, I greatly appreciate your time, and we had a great, great, great conversation. I hope you, you, you enjoyed it yourself. Well, let me tell you, um, first of all, um, your, all the links to your uh, website, to your product, is going to be on an individual post that we're going to put out there for you because this is important work that you're doing. As appreciate well, it. this will be broadcast likely live tomorrow, and that broadcast as well will have all the information for your website. So uh, thank you so kindly for having been here, Kevin Bo, and uh, keep up the great work. We need a lot of people doing this and making sure to give all the exposure possible to change this country because that we've got to do. Appreciate that. Good seeing you again. Great. I'm Egberto Wood. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, we spoke uh, about that last night, had a good conversation. Anyhow, folks, uh, let me go ahead and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, uh, Michael Rudnan, welcome aboard. AVQ, welcome aboard. Bruce Pollard, Sir Wesley08, uh, Norman Reynolds, uh, para ver, para ver, para ver, Rose Williams, uh, let's see, anybody else? Yes, Tom Hines, how are you doing, Tom? Uh, you like public financing in time? Okay, we'll talk about that. Uh, let's see. There's also uh, York Gibson. Welcome aboard. So, York Gibson, you want Trump in 2020? Why don't you give me a call? Telephone number is three. Uh, what is the telephone number? 346 248 7799. Code 254 600 9091. Give us a call. Love to talk to you and see. Um, for you to give a, a reason that you think strongly that Trump has been very good in what he has done thus far for America and deserves to have a second a second run at it. So why don't you give us a call? Let's talk about it. Uh, so that's York Gibson, Michael Rodney. Well, I called Michael already. AVQ, I think I called already as well. 
All right, Egberto, you didn't include the links in this in this video's description. Uh, I am act like I told him. I'm writing the blog that will extract his interview per se, his interview proper. And what I'm going to do with that is I'll then go ahead and make sure that everybody has access to his full, uh, to that full thing. Because I, again, we want to make sure that uh, that guys like this guy gets the the kudos that he needs or should get. So, uh, Rodney, it, it is coming. It is coming. I had a very busy morning because I had an interview with uh, to, with John Perkins this morning, so that kind of threw us off a little bit. Okay, let's go to the questions or let's see. Trump pushing ACA repeal again. Republicans have been pushing repeal and replace for years, but unlike uh, we, uh, but unlike we progressives who would establish single payer Medicare for all to phase out private insurance and better regulate big pharma's price gouging, they don't have a replacement on offer. The result will be tens of millions of Americans kicked off the health care rolls during a pandemic, resulting in tens of thousands of additional debt. This goes beyond heartless. Let me tell you something. The Supreme Court has been, uh, in as much as it's a conservative Supreme Court, it has been very measured. And you know, if I say the Supreme Court has been measured, it must be measured. I don't like conservative Supreme Courts, but this one has, you know, it seems like every time... Uh, they needed a needed to prevent catastrophe. John Roberts has been the sensible one on the court to prevent catastrophe. I can almost rest you assured that they won't be over, uh, overthrowing, overturning uh, Obamacare. Uh, it, it would it, you, you're correct. It would be cruel. We are watching on YouTube. ABQ uh, Houston is rising fast. Yes, Bruce. The infection rate in Houston is rising. We are now at level one. I just saw that on Hidalgo's uh, website. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, look, take care of yourself. A lot of people are saying, you know, I saw some things on a few websites yesterday. They said, oh, we're all going to get it. We don't all have to get it, okay? We don't all have to get it. Take care of yourself. Wear your masks and don't go out unless you need to go out. And uh, keep a close circle of only if you're going to see anybody, make sure they're in your circle. Make sure that you know that there's no permutation. I mean, people that you trust, that there's no permutations of what they've done either. You know, my my um, my daughter was sending us some sites. Actually, she sent us a, a, a Instagram thing that that points out. Uh, I don't remember what they call it, but in effect, it is something like circles of trust that no one is supposed to break. Circles of trust. And they've created their circle of trust. And in one case, one person, I think, had broken it and they were kicked out of the circle of trust. So just kind of remember that. And, and they were kicked out because they actually said, well, you know, they went and did something. And they said, well, you know, even though you're telling us the circle of trust has been broken, bye-bye, until 14 days quarantine or whatever. Okay, Michael Rudden, for after the show, an animated clip from Perkins' economic hit... Uh, Oh, okay. I love that. But beforehand, you know what? I should have. Done. Let me let me finish this, and then I'll. I may have a couple of minutes. I can play that. Uh, the vaccine. The numbers. Hello, Norman, and hello, Sir Wesley. Uh, there is no vaccine. The numbers indicate the temporary decline in coronavirus cases is on the rebound and going up. Yep. Uh, what did he say as a response? Freedom to die and to kill others to alleviate suicide. <laughs> You know, um, Norman, you see, the, the problem about it is you're too smart. Uh, not, even else, not even this guy saw the this, this, this stupor with, on, on what he was saying when he said that. You're talking about the vice president, for those who don't understand what, my, what uh, Norman is talking about. Okay, Michael Rudnan says, John Hopkins data indicates seven-day rolling average show we have more cases now than at the peak in April. That's a shame, but it's true. Rose, hello, Rose, our copy editor. Welcome, Rose. Thank you so kindly, folks. Give Rose a hand, a big hand. Yesterday, she heard, she heard my cries that I that I was burning at both ends, and she said, "Egberto, I will help you copy edit." And you know what? Uh, so I know that we have talent, great talent. So thank you, Rose. I appreciate that from the depths of my heart. You know, we love you out here. Let's see. Rose says, 
They keep on saying that hopefully, where, why is our green screen content messing up? This must be a bug in the software. Okay, uh, they keep saying uh, that hopefully they will have a vaccine soon, but they've been working on vaccines for SARS and MERS for years, and they still don't have anything for those types of coronaviruses. Developing a vaccine for a new type of virus uh, typically takes years. Our hopes that uh, CRISPR and other new technologies may give boost, but there's absolutely no guarantee. But you know what? People have to start thinking about this. There's no vaccine for AIDS. There's no vaccines for a lot of things. So for us to simply believe that there's going to be a vaccine for coronavirus, I don't know. Is in the coronavirus and sort of this, uh, well, it's not a rhinovirus, I guess. But I mean, um, you know, so we don't know. Uh, we are, is there, a, and not only that, we don't know that. We don't know if that we can ever really develop a, an immunity to it, so, which means, uh, here's the thing that you have to think about, right? If we can't develop a, inherit, in, an immunity to it, it may be a virus that only those who have their body chemistry that can fight it, you know, like those who currently get it, get it, several, get it and, and survive, that that's all we're left with. Who knows? Maybe that's what it's going to be. And in that case, that's not good news for a lot of people because it would mean that we will be wiping out a particular percentage of the population. We will be wiping out a percentage of the population. If there are some that will never gain immunity to it, who knows? I don't know. But we have smart people working, and hopefully with a new administration, we'll pour the, what we need to pour into it to get it done. Rose Williams says, money in politics, definitely number one, without addressing the problem. That's absolutely true. I'm not convinced about term. I don't believe in term limits. I tell people that all the time. A lot of folks want term limits. I bless you, those of you who want term limits. I think term lim term limits is anti-democratic. But you know, we have term limits for the president. Even that, I don't agree with. But hey, what can I say? That's just me. I would not die on the sword uh, fighting that particular issue. Gerrymandering can be solved with shortest split line enforced at the level. Oh wait, wait. Michael said with hundred dollar coupons for every citizen to donate. To the politicians of their choice, that's a good way to do public. I agree with that. I think that's been, uh, that, that, that's been out there for a while as well. Uh, gerrymandering can be solved with the shortest split line enforcing the federal level. Uh, I'd have to look at that YouTube. I don't understand it. Uh, the one thing about ranked choice voting is there should be one extra spot for no confidence. If no confidence gets the majority, the election is scrapped. All candidates eliminated from contention, including the incumbent and a special election retired we tried a few months later. That's a thought. And that's el that eliminates that theory that we have about uh, voting for the best of all of the best of all evils, right? The preferred evil. Mm, that, that's something to think about. Bruce, do we need a constitutional amendment for ranked choice? Can we build it into the electoral college fix? I don't think we need a constitutional uh, con uh, we don't need a constitutional thing for that at all. Because I don't think the Constitution says how the vote process must occur. And not only that, the voting process, I think it's actually at the state level, uh, unless there is something that the federal government does that supersedes that state level. Uh, you know, we have to look into state rights and empowerment of states and that kind of stuff. I'm not sure how that would work for voting, but I don't think uh, that that is on anything on a federal level or that that would require a constitutional amendment. Uh, Michael Run last year, there was a poll which indicated 2% of Americans think their elections work all the time. Hmm, yeah. Let's see. Let me get down here. Egberto included. Yes, I'll do that, Rudnin. Uh, let me scroll down because I want, before I finish here, uh, Rose, you're exactly right. No vaccine for some viruses. But one of the points I'm trying to make is that so far we've been unsuccessful with all the, you're correct about that. Uh, let's see, there is talk on Morning Joe that they think Trump may pull an LBJ and drop out. Uh, I heard that today uh, from uh, that guy in Louisiana um, th that's married to the, you know, that crazy Democrat, can't remember his name. Uh, I think if the, if the polls keep going like that, that just may happen. And if, that's, if that happens, though, Democrats would be in trouble because they, if they, they will only pull Donald Trump with somebody like Romney. And I think that's what Romney was setting up for. When Romney went and marched with Black Lives Matter, when Romney uh, was one of the only ones that bucked Donald Trump, 
I think that's the card Romney was playing, and I actually said that on a, one of our Politics Done Right show, uh, that I, I do think that Romney was already playing that card, that Donald Trump may have to drop out, and that, you know, and, and if Donald Trump drop out, it also means that more than likely the vice president is tainted. So we'll see. Um, there's still a lot of time for that. There's still a lot of time for, and you know, you know Donald Trump loves dramatics. So I can foresee him going into ja uh, Jackson, uh, Jacksonville, Florida, going on stage and anointing somebody for that. It's definitely a possibility. Okay, let's see what else there is. I don't think there's anything more other than to say, folks, I thank you so kindly for visiting us at Politics and Right. I know you have choices. Please do remember to support our show. We need your support. Please go to Politics Done Right. Rather, go to patreon.com slash politics done right. Again, that is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash uh, politics done right. Uh, that way you can ensure that we are on air for a very long time. Here it goes. That is the link that I just entered. Uh, you can also go to paypal.me slash politics done right. And here's the link, paypal.me slash politics done right. If you are on YouTube, you can always super chat me if you're so kindly, if you're so kindly inclined. And you can visit our store, store.politicsunright.com. And I need to do this rather quickly. One of my, my two books that are in print, as I see it, Class Warfare, The Only Resort to Right-Wing Doom, and Lose Weight and Be Fit. All these things will help support Politics and Right and our continued uh, bringing the information and doing what's necessary. You'll also get cups, T-shirts, all the good stuff that we have there. You can actually find there as well. So please consider supporting it at one of those links that I just inserted there. My name is Egberto Willies, and I forgot to put the store on, but here it is. My name is Egberto Willies. This is Politics Done Right, and you all know how I end this baby. I am what? Out! I'm Egberto Willies, host of Politics Done Right, an independent news program. I post several news videos of interest every day. I ask you so kindly to subscribe to my channel, and please leave me some comments. Thank you very much.